Okay, so welcome to our first concept lesson. Today's lesson is uh, charge and Coulomb's law. And today we're not doing a lot of math. That's tomorrow's lesson where we just do example after example after example. All right. So the first thing is we have to understand that something I mentioned yesterday, that charge is an intrinsic property. It is an intrinsic property. And not all particles have it. Okay? For example, a neutron and a neutrino. They both have NEU in them. Meaning they're neutral. They do not have charge. So not every charge has, not every particle has charge. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, other intrinsic properties are things that, you know, that like a, a particle has to have exist. Um, mass is an intrinsic property. There are massless particles, believe it or not. For example, the proton, if you think of light as a particle, um, which is debatable, but if you do think of light as a particle, it is a massless particle. Does that make sense? So it doesn't actually have mass. So later when we study the momentum of light, it has nothing to do with mv because there is no m. So we will talk about momentum of light at a later time, probably after we do this, but momentum of light is not measured by mv. Another intrinsic property um, that some particles have, not all, is what we call color charge. Color charge. Um, not very many particles have it. Like when you think electron, you think a tiny mass with charge. But you don't think color charge because color charge is something entirely different. And electrons don't actually have that property but they have a property called spin. Now you might think you know what that means, but it doesn't really mean spin. Okay, a lot of these words were chosen because they didn't know what else to do. Okay, so I'll mention that again. There are other intrinsic properties, okay? Mass, color charge, spin, etc. Let's go and talk about electrical charge. There are two types, positive and negative. Okay, these are completely arbitrary names. That's what I was just saying. They're completely arbitrary names. As the Halliday Resnick book says, uh, with Earl Walker, uh, as that book says, they could have picked, instead of you know, positive and negative, they could have picked something entirely different, like half a percent. Okay? Or it was best that you said yesterday, right? Why not do this? And then um, I think our book gives two other adjectives, you know, like you know, chocolate and vanilla. You could literally have picked any names for these. All we need to know is that there's two kinds of these. That's all we need to know. We talked yesterday about what would the universe be like if there was only one kind of electrical charge, like all positive atoms wouldn't exist. None of nature would. So, two kinds. Um, I believe the names positive and negative were dubbed by Freeman. But you'll have to do your reading to find out the exact historical names. And yes, we have three names for them. Uh, so, there are ways, there are um, many ways to classify materials like wood and metal and air and water, right? There's many ways. You can say liquid, you can say gas, you can say solid, right? But there's another pair of adjectives we can use, and that's insulator versus conductor, okay? So insulator just means it's non-conducting, and it means that it is a substance in which electrons are not free to move. So they're just not free to move. Okay, we'll talk later about what makes electrons want to move in the first place. Actually, electrons never sit still. We'll find out. Um, what are some examples of, of electrical insulators? I'm sure you know some. I'll name one. Wood. Wood generally does not conduct electricity real well, example. Okay, so students contributed other ideas like ceramic, which is used in electronic components because they're not good at conducting. Um, we heard distilled water. Pure H2O actually cannot conduct electricity. 
under normal circumstances. Uh, we also have rubber, which is why they wrap our wires in rubber to protect us from charges. Conductors are substances where electrons are free to move. I think I left an extra blank there. I'll just put free, cross that out. Okay, um, free to move. So like uh, metal, different kinds of metal, right? We said water when it's not distilled, like if there's actually something in the water, salt content makes it conductive. Uh, salt, salt in water. So I'll, I'll just put, I'll put water, but then in parentheses I'll put impure. Okay, so other solutions for sure. I just use SOLN. Uh, for, for conductors, there's a special case, guys. There's two special cases. We have superconductors and we have semiconductors. I think you know probably what those mean. If conducting means the electrons are free to move, then a superconductor would probably bring that to a hyperbole state. Not only are the electrons or they're not only they're somewhat free to move. Now I remember what word I was going to put here. Uh, somewhat free. Not only are the electrons somewhat free to move, but how would a superconductor behave? Superconductors lose the resistivity and, and conduct supposedly perfectly under certain circumstances. Uh, semiconductors are purposely designed to only conduct when you want them to. Okay, so... We don't need to give examples of this, but as you know, your computers are made with semiconductor technology and your phone and, and basically circuitry in general. So the goal is to create a material that when you want it to conduct, it will, and when you don't want it to conduct, it won't. Almost like a controlled conduction situation. And semiconductors have properties that allow us to manipulate when it will conduct and when it won't. All right, let's uh, let's clear this up. Erase this real quick. Okay, um, so going on in your packet there. It says these properties arise from the constituents of atoms. So obviously what's going on here is the atoms themselves have the charged particles, right? So as you know, atoms contain uh, protons and electrons, right? So, I mean, I don't really want to draw an atom for you. If, even if I drew, drew an atom for you, it'd just be an example of a way to think about an atomic structure. In actuality, an atom um, has a probabilistic shape. So in other words, nobody really knows what they exactly look like. And uh, if you really want to look at p orbitals and, and all that stuff, you can go back to your pen book and look and see how the structure of the atomic shells look, quote unquote, look. Okay? So that kind of thing is not necessary. But knowing that it's the electrons and the protons um, in atoms that give a rise to these conduction and, and uh, insulation properties, that's what we're talking about. Um, think of it this way. The atoms in a material, right, will either allow their electrons to travel or they won't. Right? And if the electrons are free to move, it's because the atom doesn't need them right now. Right? So in a conducting metal, the atoms um, are free to move only because the protons, the electrons are free to move, excuse me, only because the protons aren't requiring them at that moment. So they're free to go elsewhere. All right. Uh, let's talk about conduction electrons. So any electron that's free to move and not, you know, necessarily in orbit, um, is basically traveling from atom to atom, jumping from orbit to orbit, and just traveling along its way through the material. So we call that a conduction electron. And because it's moving, it's considered non-localized. So it is an electron. It desires to be near protons, but it's, it's already being canceled out by the presence of other electrons. So it can just kind of make its way around. What is net charge? Well, net charge is something that happens when an object loses some electrons or gains some electrons 
some outside influence. For example, if you take a, a piece of glass, right, let's say this is some kind of weird piece of glass, maybe a, a rod or something, and you rub it with silk, like a silk handkerchief, if you rub that on there, okay, back and forth, uh, what's going to happen is the glass will give, take glass gives. In other words, some of the electrons from the glass will end up on the cloth, and the cloth is removing those electrons from the glass. So what happens now is the glass has more positive charge than negative charge. So the electrons are leaving, and those are minus charge. The protons are staying, and those are plus charge. So when you strip off some of the electrons, well, guess what? Some of the protons are missing their electrons, and therefore the whole rod experiences a positive net charge. So you guys probably already knew that. Um, you can also reverse this. Instead of using glass and silk, you can use plastic and fur. And fur gives. Fur gives. Always forgive your, your uh, offender, right? Try, try to be a forgiving person. Fur gives. Fur gives electrons now. So if you rub fur onto plastic, the fur gives electrons to the plastic, extra electrons that the plastic didn't really need, um, and those electrons then make the, uh, the plastic rod negatively charged. So what's going on is you really have a few extra electrons that make up, and then it's given to the plastic by the fur. Okay. All right, and I'm sure if I was a little more experienced with these sorts of things, I would know which types of fur give the most electrons. No, I just don't know that. By the way, um, I mentioned this yesterday, rubbing the silk on the glass makes the glass positively charged, and rubbing the fur on the plastic makes the plastic negatively charged. Um, how do we know that? <laughs> like, how do we know they aren't both positive? Well, if you take the glass rod and the plastic rod now and put them near each other, they'll attract each other. See? So we know they're opposite charges. How do we know that the electrons are leaving the glass to go to the silk? How do we know the electrons are leaving the fur to go to the plastic? We can't see that happening, but through many, many experiments, scientists finally figure that out, that glass gives and fur gives. Okay? So that was, you know, I'm sure not how they first noticed these things. They probably just first noticed, hey, this plastic rod is attracting this glass rod, or perhaps, wow, these two glass rods, we rubbed them with silk, they don't want to be near each other. They're pushing each other apart. So they noticed first that they were attracting rods or, or rejecting rods, no. But then later figured out who was giving who the electrons. That was, I'm sure, a whole different set of experiments. Okay, so the purpose of that last bullet was just to help you understand that um, some electrons can move around and some cannot. Anyone that can move around is considered a conduction electron. And those electrons can either be carried from one substance to another or taken from a substance and thereby making objects feel like they themselves are charged. So like the glass rod feels like a positive, one big fat proton, you know, with multiple charges on it. Um, I probably shouldn't have said proton, because um, a proton has exactly a plus one charge. This glass rod probably right now has a, a lot of proton charge on it, if that makes sense. Uh, same thing with this plastic rod, it has a lot of negative charge. We'll talk about charge quantization a little bit later. You can actually count how many electrons are free um, using charge, uh, charge counting. Okay, so that would be done through uh, quantization. And it's, it's approximate, but let's go now to isolation. Isolation just means you've taken an object that's got charge on it. Let's say it's that plastic rod. Uh, so remember the plastic rod, the fur gives, right? So it gives its electrons. If you take this thing and you hang it from a, a string in the middle of a room, right, it's not going to change its charge because there's nothing around it to steal its electrons. The only way it can lose those electrons, those extra electrons it has, is if something takes those extra electrons. So maybe if you walk up to it and touch it, some of the electrons get on your body. Or maybe if you stick a wire up to it, some of the electrons will travel through the wire. But as far as we can tell, hanging it from the ceiling is just going to stay like that. And if it's in vacuum and there's no air to steal some of the electrons, those electrons can stay there for forever, theoretically. Okay, so put that sucker in vacuum and it's hanging by a thread. 
maybe some of the ones were like on the doors of red bread, but that thing's going to have a net charge for a very long time. I mean, why not? Okay, so that's called isolation. You, you separate from anything that could steal its electrons. Grounding is the completely opposite of isolation. Grounding means you intentionally attach, you know, a wire to it, you know, and then you attach that to a large piece of metal or something. So we call any large thing that can receive electrons, we call that a ground. So it could be a huge hunk of metal, and it can take so many extra free electrons, it'll just steal all the electrons, all the extra electrons from the plasma. So those electrons will then travel into the, the ground. It could mean the physical ground of the earth, or it could mean a large metal object, or large conducting body of water, or whatever. But it will steal those extra electrons, putting the rod back to neutral. So when that happens, it's not like there's no more electrons. It's just there's no more net charge, meaning the electrons that are in the plastic rod are doing their thing, orbiting their nucleus, and they're not busy acting as ex excess charge. Okay? So there's still electrons in there because there's still atoms, but there's no extra electrons, if that makes sense. So grounding is the process of removing net charge, you could say. But isolation and grounding are antonyms almost. Conduction path is pretty obvious what that is. Conduction path. So if you, if you attach the wire to the plastic rod and the charges are traveling through that wire to the ground, that's the chosen conduction path. So the, the electrons, and this is pretty phenomenal, electrons just know the shortest path. They know which way they want to go to minimize, um, to minimize their work. So they'll just travel in as fast as they possible into the, into the ground or into the large metal object. So that whatever path they take is just called the conduction path. Now let's talk about induction for a minute. Induction, if you think of it as charges are set up by induction, okay? So some things are charged because you rub them with fur or silk. You know what I mean? That's not induction. Induction is when you have, let's say, a plastic rod, right? Can't spell plastic, but there's a plastic rod. And it's not charged. It's just a plastic rod. It's not charged up at all. Maybe it was recently grounded, so it's totally neutral. And then along comes, you know, a, like a metal sphere or something. And, or let's not do metal sphere. Uh, yeah, let's do metal sphere. And the metal sphere is intentionally positively charged. Okay? So somebody worked very hard to charge this little sphere. So they bring this sphere somewhere near the rod. And the closer you get, the more this happens. But you bring the plastic rod and the sphere close to each other. And what happens is the atoms in the plastic rod start to polarize. They're like, hold on. We don't want to be, the, the protons are like, uh, we don't want to be near the, the plastic. So we don't want to be near the positive parts of this ball because they repel. But the protons can't really move very well. They're so heavy. So the electrons do their thing, and they travel to this side, leaving their protons behind. So what happened there was a charge was induced. Now this object, this plastic rod, is still technically neutral because it has an equal number of pluses and minuses. But the pluses are on the right, and the minuses are on the left. So you could actually use that little plastic rod now as a charged object, as long as you keep you know, near one end of it. So you know, if you come over here, you would really feel like you were near a plastic or near a positively charged plastic rod. You know what I mean? On the other hand, if you went to the other side and you stood over here, you would feel like you're really near a negatively charged plastic rod. The truth is the plastic rod's truly neutral but the charge was polarized. So it's like it has the uh, illusion of being a charged rod because of the way it separates. And this is called inductive charge, induced charge. It's a little bit different from rubbing it with fur or rubbing it with silk. So the word induction doesn't mean what it means in everyday life. In electrical theory, induction just means from a distance you have created a change in a situation. So sometimes we induce a current. That means from a distance we set up a current. That was that was what was going on in that um, 
that Mobius strip car thing. He was setting up little currents inside that magnetic field. But it was from a distance. It was through, through a, a field, actually, we'll talk about later. Okay, um, now, after you have charges stacked up, you know, on objects, maybe one positively charged object and one negatively charged object, you start to notice that they behave around each other. So if you put, uh, the, let's say you have two, two rods that are positively charged and uh, one rod that is negatively charged. If you start putting these two near each other, you'll notice they start to interact. They'll actually pull towards each other. You put them both in outer space where there's no other influences around, no planets, no stars, no gravity, roughly. They're, they will literally eventually collide into each other. They want to come to each other. Um, and the opposite is true if you put the two blues together. So if you put the two blues together, they will repel each other, uh, trying to escape each other. Okay? So obviously this has been noticed long before it's been understood, right? People notice these things. I'm like, dude, that's weird. My hair is standing on end. It's trying to get away from my body. You know, or they'll notice that this ball is like magically pushing this other ball across the table and neither of them are touching. Like, what's going on? So there's this imaginary interaction, like, or actually there's, there's a visible interaction, not imaginary, and uh, we call it electrical force. And obviously the key is to understand that like charges attract and opposite charges or like charges repel, excuse me, opposite charges attract. You guys know that. This is why they say opposites attract, right? Now this makes, um, this makes electrical force very different from gravity because gravity, there's only one type of gravitational property an object can have, massness, right? If something has massness and something else has massness, they attract each other, end of story. But in electrical theory, something can have sharpness, and something else can have sharpness, and two things can happen. They can attract or repel. So because there's two kinds of charge, electrical charge, we have two types of interaction. And because there's only one type of mass, as far as we know, um, there's only one type of force, attractive force. So all the equations I'm about to show you match beautifully with gravity, except for one thing. Gravity always attracts. And strangely, um, electric or centrifugal is either attractive or repulsive. That's one major difference between electrical theory and gravity theory. But the equations themselves, the names of the quantities, the fields, the potential energy, all that, all the names of the things, the equations look almost identical. But they're either attractive and repulsive, and so it's just only gravity. So scientists are playing around with the idea that maybe there is a repulsive type of gravity. And that's the gravity. The matter, um, not the matter, excuse me, uh, possibly other types of matter that repel each other. Uh, that would maybe answer some weird questions about our universe and the shape and size and stuff like that. But in strict theory, we don't. Let's go um, to the equations. So if you're trying to fill in equations, you remember that the force of gravity was G mass 1 times mass 2 over R squared. You probably remember that. Okay, well now, look at the equation. It's K charge 1 charge 2 over R squared. It's the same equation. Instead of M1 and M2, we have charge 1 and charge 2. Q means charge. Q always means charge. K is just a number. You probably remember that G was 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Well, K is also just a number. It's 9 times 10 to the minus 10. Okay? So it's just a different number. And then the charges are taking the place of mass. So we used to think in terms of mass 1 times mass 2. Now we're thinking charge 1 times charge 2. So R squared is the same as before. It's the separation distance between the two objects. Notice I put a magnitude symbol on here. See the, uh, the absolute value bars? That means we're only talking about the strength of the force right now. So you'll notice there's no factors here. Ms. Shore did not put any harpoon in the top of variables. No hats. No little you know, like a vector symbols. Anyway, this is just how big is the force? 
one nanny could be with ten people. Well, usually they're actually quite small, so so they're not anywhere near a nanny, but that's what that stands for. The next line there says F12 equals negative F21 equals, and then we put KQ1, Q2 over R squared R hat where r is a unit vector given by pointing in the direction of the vector. So it should just say a unit vector, not given. It should say a unit vector that points. It is a unit vector that points in the direction of the vector that points from charge 1 to charge 2. Okay, this is going to take a little bit of time to get used to, but basically it works like this. If you have a positive charge called Q1, and a positive charge called Q2. When I write F12, it's pronounced, and maybe you can even say this with me out loud. I'll say it first and then you can repeat it. Um, F12 is pronounced the force on charge 1 caused by charge 2. I'll say that back. It's the force caused by charge 1 operating on charge 2. So just like sometimes you might push a friend and they might push you, when you push a friend, let's say your name is uh, Tom and their name is Bob, uh, force Tom Bob would be the force Tom puts on Bob. So the acting one is mentioned first. So F12 means force one on two. So there's two charges. They're both experiencing forces. Now, the thing about Newton's third law, remember, I'm almost done. The thing about Newton's third law is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So that's what this part means right here when it says F12 is the opposite of F21. It just means if there's a charge, acting, let's say charge A is acting on charge B, well, charge B is also acting on charge A, and there's an equal magnitude of force there. Okay? The only difference is the direction. In this drawing here, F12 is pointing to the right, trying to repel Q2 away from Q1. But if you're on, if you're standing here on Q2, you would interpret it differently. You would say, hey, I'm on Q2 and we're pushing Q1 away. So if you're standing at Q1, you would say, charge one is pushing charge two to the right. But if you're standing at charge number two, you would say, wait, charge two is pushing charge one to the left. So the first case is called F12 when you're standing at point 1. And the second one is called F21. That's when you're standing at point 2. And the only difference is the opposite direction there. The force is not the same. Which means that if you take this from a gravity standpoint, we have our Earth is pulling on the moon as much as the moon is pulling on the Earth right now. Both the moon and the Earth are pulling on each other with the same force. The only reason the moon appears to do all the moving is because it's so much lighter. The same is true for charges. The, the more charged object will tend to look more stationary. And the less charged object will just like orbit around it or run away from it or whatever. So the one that moves more is, is the one that has the lesser mass and sometimes the lesser star mass. Okay? So I hope I said that clearly. Um, we'll pick it up from here tomorrow. I'm going to repeat what I said there on the like charges versus like charges. Yeah. And tomorrow is mostly examples. So I have a few more comments to make. Like down below, there's a few more things to say, but that's pretty much the gist of the chapter. The rest is a lot of math examples. That's like the whole chapter, by the way, chapter 21. So in case you're worried about too much content, I don't think that's an issue here. I think there's only like 11 chapters, and I can teach a chapter every couple days, really. It's mastery that we need to worry about. Uh, all right, I'm going to cut off the last few seconds.